Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to our Back to Basics series. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and Chief Product Officer of Open Vault. Today, we're tackling an intriguing topic that has sparked endless debates, dispelling myths of capacitance effects on video and high-speed data. It's a subject surrounded by misconceptions and folklore, especially concerning its impact on video quality and data transmission speeds. But fear not, we are not embarking on this quest alone. Joining us is the esteemed Ron Rannick, a titan in a field whose insights and exp expertise are second to none when it comes to the nuances of RF signals and how they are transmitted through space and time. To our new viewers, please do take a moment to check out Ron's impressive bio in the show details below. He has impressive background and we are quite lucky to have him here today to explain why it may not be capacitance after all that is causing our intermittent connections. In fact, there may just be some chemistry involved. Ron, welcome back. How are you doing today? Thanks, Brady, <clears throat> and welcome uh... Welcome to you too, and welcome to everybody who's tuning into the uh, the live stream event. And if you're watching this during the recording, thanks for tuning into that too. Um, yes, this is going to be a fun presentation. Uh, it's chemistry class. Now, understand, I haven't taken chemistry since uh, more than half a century ago, <laughs> so I'm dating myself a little bit. But I think most of you already know that I'm a really old cable guy. Um, but this will be a fun one. It, the presentation today is based on an article I wrote for Communications Technology several years ago. Um, I want to say the 2008 time frame, if I remember correctly. So let me go ahead and share my screen and click all the right buttons here, and, and we'll get this uh, this show underway. And Excellent. Well, while Ron's getting started, folks, we'd love if you hit that subscribe notification bell and give us a thumbs up for Ron's presentation today. Thank you, Ron. Take oh, it you're away. welcome. You're welcome, Brady, and thanks again for the very kind words. So the uh, subject today is chemistry class. Yes, and if you took chemistry in high school or, or college, uh, this will bring back some memories of, of some maybe of the, some bad ones at that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it'll be fun because it yes. really does dispel a, a bit of a myth. And and as uh, as Brady noted, there is this um, widespread myth out there about this effect that I'm about to discuss, and and I'm here to debunk that myth. So here's the, the typical problem, and I'll ask the question, how many times have you gone to a subscriber's home uh, to deal with a trouble call or the, the customer's complaining of, of snowy pictures on the analog channels, assuming that your system still has them, and yeah, there are still some out there, or you've got issues with uh, some of the dig some or all of the digital channels, tiling in the digital video or intermittent errors in the in the internet service, but, and, and then the uh, you, know, you look at this and say, hey, what, what the heck is going on here? So, yeah, drop it in the chat do, too if you've seen it, if you guys have experienced this personally too. Oh, yeah, please let us know. Um, well, and here's the troubleshooting process you go to the, the tap or the side of the house and you disconnect that uh, the connector, the, the drop cable from the ground block or splitter or the tap spigot out the pole or pedestal. Look it up to a signal level meter. Um, or some other test instrument, you look and say, well, well signal, signal levels are okay. So um, you reconnect the drop cable, and amazingly, everything is fixed. The no problem pixels, found. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, whatever problem there was is gone now. The snowy pictures are, are back to good quality, and any digital problems, uh, well, they just stopped being problems. So what on earth is going on here? Now, there's, uh, here's the myth. Um, this explanation's been around for decades, and the, uh, <laughs> the debate and discussions and, and whatnot on, on social media and on the old SCTE list email reflector and on the cable TV list email reflector and Facebook groups and stuff um, says that it has to do with some mysterious static buildup or capacitance effect. Excess voltage. Yeah, I've heard so many different possible reasons as to why this happens. And and the solution is always just disconnect and reconnect a cable and that's going to fix it. Yeah, that's and that's the, you know, the, the, the believed the believed to be fixed is you disconnect the drop and you hook it back up to the test equipment and disconnect it from the test equipment and hook it back up to the to the ground block. Somehow that activity discharge some kind of mysterious static or charge buildup 
in the drop cable and solved the problem. Ooh. Not and it. Wrong answer. It is absolutely <laughs> not that at all. So <laughs> what's going on? Well, what's going on isn't quite as mysterious or strange as some unknown capacitance or static buildup effect. No this magic. is good old fashioned corrosion and the chemistry of corrosion. So let's uh, first try to figure out what the heck corrosion is. Um, the answer you see on the screen here comes from a, a 1992 Naval Facilities Engineering Command document called Corrosion Control. And of course, for those of you who might have served in the Navy or, or have a family member or friend who did, you're probably very aware that the, the whole idea of corrosion is very important to the Navy, uh, along with a lot of other people. But the description in that document says corrosion is the destructive attack of a metal through interaction with its environment. And of course, almost all of us have some experience with corrosion, and it might be as simple as a tarnished penny in our pocket, if you still carry change in your pocket, um, maybe a rusty bolt or nut or both, and maybe you've tried to tried to get a, a rusty nut off of a rusted bolt, and so you're having to deal with the, the um, effects of corrosion. So that brings us then to the next question, and that is, why on earth does corrosion happen? And if we think about the the whole uh, the whole idea of corrosion and and metals and and ore processing, um, companies go out and and dig mines in in mountains and and in the ground and whatnot, and they're after ores to uh, to be able to extract metals from those ores, and the the vast majority of metals exist in nature, so in the mountains and and in the in the ground usually in some kind of chemical combination with other elements. And we call those things ores. So uh, we, now not necessarily Brady and me, but um, we refine various ores to get relatively pure metals and alloys. And that, that process involves uh, smelting these ores down to um, basically get rid of the, the unwanted pieces and parts and leave just the, the metals that we're after. And, and here's an important part, because this, this is what leads up to corrosion. So if you think about the energy content of refined metals and alloys, it's higher than that of the original ore. So if you take a piece of, of cast iron that's you know, been refined and, and so on, the energy content in that cast iron is higher than, than the energy content of iron ore. So what's going on? Well, the metals and the alloys are constantly trying to change back into a lower energy ore or an ore-like compound. And well, what we get out of that process is corrosion. So let's take a look at the chemistry. And here we are uh, rattling our memory banks about chemist things we learned in chemistry class a long time ago. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through examples of how to solve all these equations and everything. Just show this as an example. Thankfully, because um, you were getting a little ornery on that previous slide. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah I know. That's, that's, really, that's really bad, <laughs> even on a Friday. <laughs> even for well, our standards, that was bad, I agree. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So let's, let's think about the center conductor and drop cable. And in most drop cables, that center conductor is copper clad steel. The steel provides um, very, very good strength, uh, tensile strength and whatnot. And then the copper cladding provides the path for the RF uh, current to pass through. Uh, from a previous session that we did on skin effect, I think most of you may remember that RF current likes to travel on and near the surface of a metallic conductor. So the copper cladding is perfect for that. So let's look at just the copper cladding part of that, um, of the center conductor as it oxidizes. Now, it's important to understand that this also applies to hardline cable, whether it's copper clad aluminum or solid copper center conductor, as, uh, as is the case in some hardline cables. So here's the basic chemical reaction in the equation that you see there. Now, you don't have to memorize this, but just understand that this is basic chemistry here. And what's important is the term on the right side of the equation. That 2CuOs, and the S means solid, and in case you're interested on the left-hand side, of the arrow, the S means solid and the G means gas. So that's the states of these various things at room temperature. So the term on the right side of the equation is copper oxide. Now, in practice, there are two forms of copper oxide that we're concerned with when that copper clad center conductor oxidizes in air. 
The first is called copper one oxide, which is also called cuprous oxide. And the chemical designation is Cu2O. So there's the copper and then there's the O for oxygen. And that often has a reddish or reddish brown color. And then the second type of cop copper oxide is copper two oxide or cupric oxide. And you'll notice we've got cuprous oxide and cupric oxide. And the ke chemical designation for this second one is CuO. So there's the copper and there's the, the ox oxygen there. And its color is kind of kind of blackish. And you've probably seen examples of both when, uh, when you've seen uh, tarnished copper um, out in the environment. Yeah, so I was going to ask, like, what's that type of uh, oxide that we typically get on coax cables and connectors and, and everything that we deal with in a plant? Oh, we're going to get into that. And it's, <laughs> it, it can be cuprous oxide. It can be cupric oxide. It can be copper sulfide and some other stuff. And uh, as we'll see here in a moment, this stuff can build up in layers. And the layers themselves are pretty thin. But um, oh, and and well, yeah, and, and just want to give a quick shout out to username redacted. To, uh, he he's uh, he he responded to uh, my really bad joke and, and said that's almost as bad as the damplifier joke that we had uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, um, thanks, username redacted, for uh, <laughs> for joining in on. Yeah, if I, was, if I were sharing a joke like that, I'd probably redact my name. <laughs> <laughs> I should redact my name. <laughs> anyway, um, the the important point here is that metal oxides in general. Um, are pretty crummy conductors. So the, the cuprous oxide, the Cu2O, um, is actually considered a P-type semiconductor. So see where this is headed? So, so, so when you're saying that this oxide is a P-type semiconductor, that means it could actually, it could actually do things in our plant, like maybe create signals or something, or, or modify signals in our plant that are being transmitted. It can, but I think more likely you're going to see this behave like an attenuator, as we'll talk about later. But yeah, okay. it can do very, very strange things. And, and there's been some concern about, uh, well, we know that oxidation or corrosion in the signal path can be a source of common path distortion. Yeah. And that may be right there one reason why, uh, why you see this corrosion um, resulting in common path distortion, particularly in the hardline plant where the, the RF levels are a lot higher. Um, so yeah, something else to kind of tuck back into the the, yes. uh, the memory banks, and that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that for, up for a future episode, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. All right. Um, so far, I've talked about what happens when copper is exposed to oxygen. So you know, just in the air. But I think in the real world, we've we've seen that copper can be exposed to a lot of different things, and you get in uh, coastal environments or environments where you've got a lot of humidity. Um, the humid air kind of aggravates things. So not only do you have the oxygen in the air, but if you've got moisture in the air now, um, the, the, uh, that corrosion often takes on a green patina. And a really good example is the Statue of Liberty. And I've got a picture of it there on the, on the right side. And that green is a form of corrosion. You've probably seen it on copper flashing used on roofs or in some cases buildings that have copper, uh, copper uh, sheet copper roofs. We'll, we'll get a nice patina after exposure to the elements um, over a period of time. Now, of course, the period of time is relative. It can occur fairly quickly in some cases, and sometimes it can take a long time. But that green color that we see, for example, on the Statue of Liberty is what's known as a one-to-one -one mole mixture of, of CuOH2 and CuCO3. So there's the there's the uh, the chemical equation for it down below. I'm not going to go through that again. <laughs> Just a reminder that the parentheses with the S and G in it are to indicate solid and gas at room temperature. So, yeah, there's more. <laughs> um, but but it's wait. not. Yes, that's right. But it's it's not that bad. Um, what I want to look at now is is the uh, patina formation on clean copper in different environments, uh, marine environments. So that would be typical of say coastal environments, where you're close to uh, salt spray from from the ocean. Um, or maybe you're on uh, on the shore of one of the Great Lakes or something where you've got a lot of a uh, lot of stuff in the air. Urban environments where you've got automobile exhaust and you know, pollution from factories and other things, and even in rural environments out in the middle of nowhere. Now, the, the information that I'm going to discuss here comes from a, a paper called Modeling and Rendering Metallic um, Patinas. And let me, in case people are interested in digging that up, let me move that out of the way. So that was a 1996 paper um, by by Dorsey and 
Hanrahan. Yeah. No, nothing, nothing. I don't think there's any relation there, even though it's kind of an oddball last name that starts with an H like mine does. All right. So let's <laughs> let's take a look at this then. So when this happens, that is when clean copper is is in a in an environment like a marine environment or an urban environment or or rural environments. Um, right next to the copper, um, we get copper sulfide forming. And that's followed by a, la a layer of the, the mineral cuprite. So we talked about that earlier, Cu2O. Then after that is aticumite or copper chloride hydroxide. And there's the formula for it. But that's a halide material. And of course, what's halide? Um, that gets into the world of salts, if I remember my chemistry. And that last one, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, but I'm going to call it posenjakite or copper sulfate hydroxide hydrate. That's so pretty you good, can see we've got, we've got chemistry. <laughs> There's chemistry going on here on the center, that <laughs> copper center conductor. And chemicals I haven't even heard about before. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even talking about the shield of the cable. That's yeah. a, you know, aluminum. And um, there, there's a whole other chemistry class going on with that. So depending on the specific environment and the amount of moisture in the air and you know, the presence of oxygen and the presence of all this other stuff in the air, um, that patina can include a bunch of stuff that you look at and you say, wow, this is like going into a rock shop. Malachite, I've got some in my rock collection over here off to the side, antlerite, brokenite, gerhardite, and then even organic compounds. So things can get kind of messy when you talk about the, the corrosion of copper. Now, this is an important point. And all these patinas that I've just discussed are really, really thin. And, and I'm talking microscopically thin, anywhere from a few tenths of a micrometer, which is what we call a micron to perhaps a few microns. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that. And I'm sure just about everybody who's pulled apart a really nasty corroded connector has got that stuff is just growing on it big time. And it's not it's not a thin patina by any means. But um, if we just think about the exposure to the environment without that buildup of the really nasty stuff, the patinas tend to be pretty thin. Well, that that's so, good news to me. That, that means if that gets on my center conductor, I can just take out my pen knife and, and scratch that right off to get rid of the... Oh, no, uh, that. Oh, no. Where's, where's that buzzer sound again? No, don't do that. No, don't. Uh, there is a little... <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you. There is a trick. Now, I didn't put a slide together, but I've done this before. You've got a... Let's say you've got a um, F connector on the end of a drop cable and you've got the center conductor sticking out. You can polish that a little bit if you've got a pencil with a good eraser on it you just poke the center conductor into the eraser rotate the pencil a few times and that the eraser will actually polish off that patina and much better to, recommendation yeah much better recommendation i wouldn't do it too long though you don't want to get and it, it would take a lot of abrasion to get through that copper cladding but you definitely don't want to use a knife or something but you could polish it up with a pencil eraser if you want yeah. all right so take a look at the picture on the right there and you can see what looks like number six solid copper wire. And the one on the left has been kind of sanded down to, to expose clean copper. And the one on the right is what you're probably used to seeing um, yeah. that ground wire look like on the on a utility pole or the side of a house or something. And it's got, it gets that kind of, in this case, kind of brownish patina. Well, that copper, the co copper sulfide patina is what produces that brown color. And cuprite produces a kind of a reddish brown color. So the, the one on the right in this picture is probably a little bit of a mix of the two, cuprite and copper sulfide. Now, the formation of those patinas can actually happen fairly quickly. Um, now, the other patinas that I talked about earlier, they, they generally take a fair amount of time. But still, if that, if that drop cable center conductor is exposed to the environment for any length of time, um, those things will start to build up too. But you can definitely count on copper sulfide and cuprite building up reasonably fast. Now, the, the, um, the exposed bare center conductor is going to oxidize. And notice what I've got in parentheses there. I consider the center conductor exposed even if it's inside of a mating connector. Now, it tends to be not quite as exposed as one just hanging out in the air, whether it's at the pole or pedestal or inside of a box on the side of the house. Um, but oxygen is present in that center conductor seizure mechanism. And you're going to get oxidation there and it's going to take a lot longer, but you're still going to get it there unless you could somehow figure out how to, how to prep that, that uh, cable and put the connector on in a night, pure nitrogen environment and then encapsulate the, the, uh, the whole connector interface in, in a, some kind of a um, inert gas like nitrogen or something. But 
then yeah, we can't do that. That's not practical. So, and, we, and when you say inside the mating connector, so you're saying even that F connector, when it's connected to another connector and, and, you, and we think everything's all sealed up, you're seeing even in that environment, we're going to get corrosion on these connectors. It's not just a, it's not just an F connector dangling out in the wind that's going to get corrosion. But even an yeah. F connector that's inserted into another mating connector is also going yeah. to get corrosion on it. Yeah, on a on a splitter, a ground block, the tap spigot, um, you can slow it down, of course, with good weatherproofing and and um, the process because it's not, hopefully, it's not as, as exposed as as uh, just the bare center conductor in a in an F connector hanging out right. in the open air. Um, I mean, that, the oxidation is going to happen, but it, it'll, it's probably going to take a lot longer, but it still it, will happen. Would also occur inside subscribers' homes as well? It could. Um, if you get into places um, where indoor humidity is fairly high, you could see corrosion inside the, ho the houses. Um, probably more likely it's going to be outside because you've got you know, exposure to the elements and big, big temperature changes and, and moisture from rain and, and uh, and whatnot that's going to be probably a bit more aggravating as a contributor to that corrosion than it, than something going on inside the house. But yeah, it's I mean copper's copper and it's going to corrode over time. That's just the way it is. So now we have this brownish or reddish brown color um, on our center conductor, and that means that that originally nice shiny clean copper has this very thin microscopic patina of copper sulfide or maybe cuprite or both and perhaps other stuff, depending on the environment. And here, remember the, uh, the cuprous oxide was, was a P type center conductor, yeah. but cuprite or copper one oxide is not a good conductor. And what does that sound like? An insulator. Attenuator. Yeah, insulator or attenuator. Yeah. yeah, it could be an insulator, but I think you're gonna find that it's gonna actually behave more like an attenuator than an insulator. It'd have to be really, really bad to be, to be an insulator, but it's not, it's, yeah, insulator is probably a good term, but I like the term attenuator. So we'll call it an unintentional attenuator. So here's what's really going on. So you disconnect the drop from the mating interface. You hook it up to a signal level meter, make your signal level measurement, disconnect the drop from the meter, plug it back into the mating interface, and what the heck happens? Well, this scrubbing or scraping action of disconnecting the drop, hooking it up to your meter, or other instrument, disconnecting it from the meter or instrument, reconnecting it to the ground block or whatever, that actually scrapes through some of that center conductor patina and it exposes fresh copper. And remember what I mentioned earlier, that patina is microscopically thin, um, maybe a few microns thick, but in many cases, less than a micron. So it doesn't take a lot to scrape away some of that microscopically thin patina to get down to the copper. So the result, get this little box out of the way, proper signal levels, <laughs> because we have just removed that attenuator from the center conductor. And again, keep in mind, I have not talked at all about corrosion that, that can occur in the shield. Because remember in, in our drop cable, we've got aluminum braid and we have what's called APA tape over the dielectric. That's aluminum polypropylene aluminum tape and then braid surrounding that. And if you're using tri-shield, then you've got another layer of tape on top of that. And if quad shield, another layer of braid on top of that, that layer of tape. Um, when aluminum oxidizes, you get that kind of white um, layer on the outside of it, and that's an, an aluminum oxide. And it's also not a very good conductor. I haven't touched on the chemistry involved with that, but that also can aggravate things. So if you get any corrosion inside the, uh, the shield, uh, particularly where it mates with the F connector, you can also see similar problem. So you, now you've got the double aggravation of the, of the corrosion on the center conductor or possible corrosion on the center conductor and corrosion in the, the shield um, reducing drop levels. So you jiggle things around and you, you know, disconnect, reconnect and disconnect and reconnect and you've scraped away the copper on the center conductor. And if there was maybe a little bit of corrosion on the thread, you unscrew the connector and screw it back in that scrapes away some of that, that uh, oxidation that's going on there. And then you're back to bare metal again and things are working fine. Um, yeah, that's what's going on. It's nothing mysterious or magic. So what can you do to prevent it? When And we'll get back to the center conductor. And as we alluded to earlier, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You can, of course, significantly slow down the process, but it's tough to stop it altogether, at least in the environments in which we work. So here's some tips. And 
getting close to the to the end of this one. So today's session will be a little bit shorter than some of our other sessions. But many drop rolls of drop cable come with a little soft plastic cap that that's put on the end of the the cable by the manufacturer. So my recommendation is don't throw those things in the trash can. Keep them and yeah. cap the exposed ends of the reels of drop cable in the warehouse, um, in your truck or van. Um, this is going to help to reduce the likelihood of moisture being wicked into the cable uh, from the end of the cable. And if you are out in the field and you've got to pull off a length of cable to do some wiring in the home or pull, you know, some, pull some messenger cable off to string from the pole to the house or flooded cable for the underground stuff, pull off the cable that you need, um, clip, the, clip the, the cable and put the little, the little cap back on the end of the cable. That, that just helps. And how far would you cl recommend clipping that cable back? Are you talking about just the first inch or you clip back a foot? Well, well get... I mean, you can, if, if, the, if it's exposed and it's not capped up, yeah, chop off, lop off an inch or two. There's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. But always try to keep the, the reel of cable capped on the end. Keep that exposed reel capped. And then you pull off the 100 foot length of cable. You need to do whatever you're doing. And you, know, you cut the cable at the reel, put the cap back on the, the cable. Um, on the reel. Now, this is an important one. Don't touch the exposed center conductor with your fingers or dirty gloves. And take a look at the the uh, center conductor. Just visually inspect it. Make sure there's no dirt or grease or any at least anything you can see on there. And getting back to that question you had earlier, Brady, don't <laughs> cut or scrape the center conductor with a knife or other sharp object. Don't do it. Don't, no, 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 don't. It's just so tempting, Ron. You know I love my pocket knife. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I used to carry a nice pocket knife, but it got confiscated at an airport one time. <laughs> I forgot to take it out of my pocket. And uh, well, bummer. Okay. Um, now the, you go through the connector installation process. So that means properly prepping the end of the cable with a with a uh, suitable tool, put the connector on, crimp it, you know, all that stuff. So you will assume that you've got this properly installed connector. Torque that connector to the mating interface, the tap spigot, the splitter, the ground block to 20 to 30 pound inches of torque, um, maybe even on uh, the drop amplifier. But do be careful on customer premises equipment, because if you try to tighten it to 20 or 30 pound inches of torque, you're liable to, to snap off the connector from the printed circuit board. So at least on the, the, stout, uh, the stout interfaces, like the splitter or directional coupler or ground block or the, the tap spigot, tighten it up good. This is important, and I can't overemphasize this enough weatherproof all interfaces on all outdoor connectors, even those inside of a pedestal, a vault, and the box on the side of the customer's home. Weatherproof them. And the good news is most compression F connectors we use these days have at least one, maybe more internal O-rings, which helps with weatherproofing. And the way the connectors are designed is when you do the crimp, it puts a 360 degree compression crimp um, and a seal on the jacket. So that helps to keep moisture out. But I still like the idea of sealing sleeves on the threads. So you pop the sealing sleeve on, let's say the splitter or ground block and then screw the connector into it. And that protects the threads and helps to prevent moisture from getting into the threads uh, of the connector. When things are really nasty, boots and grease. Um, these were widely used by the cable industry back in the day of the old hex crimp uh, one piece F connectors, and they work really well. Uh, the boots look like spark plug boots. That's why they yeah. get the name boots. And don't put a boot on a connector unless you fill it with silicone grease. If you just put a boot over a connector with nothing in it, that acts like a terrarium. And if moisture gets in there, it will not get out and you're inviting corrosion. So. If you've got to use boots in those really nasty environments, make sure you, that you have silicone grease in them. That's that's critical. So I'm, I'm glad we have a couple of questions coming in in the chat. I have a couple of my own that I want to throw out first that you just mentioned, Ron. Um, so you you talked about on the connectors, you know, ha having sealed connectors everywhere out on the on the uh, in the field. And I've had technicians push back about, well, you know, we don't, you know, maybe large cable operators use those sealed connectors, but they're more expensive. And we don't use the sealed connectors in our plant because we're, you know, we're not up against the ocean. We're in a more dry area. Um, what are what are your thoughts on those? Because you, you kind of indicate we really should be using sealed connectors everywhere. 
Well, we should. Um, remember, even outside, you've got humidity in the air. And, and if you think about a, an environment like uh, Tucson or Phoenix, you say, well, okay, that's an, a desert environment. Um, but think about the monsoon that occurs there. When the monsoon happens, they get rain, lots and lots of rain. Yeah. So there's moisture in the air. Um, you're not going to get away from moisture. And you may say, well, yeah, the, 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 the premium sealed um, compression connectors that we have today, and they're available from just about every, every manufacturer now, work real well. They're very, very well designed. Um, use them if you can. If you can't and use them, the old one-piece hex crimp connectors, and I'm not even sure if um, they're still being made anymore, but if they are, those should have boots and grease on them on all outdoor connectors. Uh, when I worked for major cable operator back in the 80s, in the late 80s, we did a we combined with a couple other cable companies to uh, to do a really, really in-depth series of tests on all the F connectors available to the industry at the time. And um, I, I was running the, the corporate lab at the company where I worked, and and um, we teamed up with the other corporate labs, and, and we all did pieces and parts of the testing and stuff that we didn't have the, the equipment for. We, we uh, sent out to contract companies to do testing. And one of the things we found was that the old – um, one piece hex crimp F connector actually works well, works very well if it's installed properly. And that's the key. Yes. And one of the things that we've, one of the things that we found is for the outdoors, you've got to use boots and grease with that type of connector. You have to, there's no, I mean, there's seal no way up. around it. Moisture. Yeah. You got to seal it up. Yeah. Moisture's going to get in if you don't, but you got to have the grease in there and all that worked really well. And I think if I remember correctly, the limit on our testing for what's called accelerated aging tests was 15 years. I think that was just the limit of the test. And when things were done right, um, those connectors passed those accelerated aging tests out to the 15 year limit of the test. And we're talking salt spray tests and, and all kinds of other stuff that was done. It was, it was a pretty, pretty sophisticated bunch of testing. And uh, we learned a lot from that. But if you think about the cost of not using today's connectors, you say, oh, yeah, they're more expensive. That's true. They are. Um, the cost to roll a truck. <laughs> what's a cost to what's a cost to roll a truck to to uh, to go out there and fix that corrosion problem? So you got one service call and one truck roll. There's a hundred dollar bill. How many? How many? That's a lot connectors? of connectors. <laughs> you buy a lot of connectors for that yeah. price. So yeah, spend the money now. Um, just you know, you just cry once and <laughs> you do it right. Do it right. Um, anyway. Shout out to Tomas from Poland. Tomas, thanks for spending your Friday evening with us watching our show. We really appreciate that. Um, Hank Jan says, does the thin patina start CPD near the amplifier output? So, Ron, you mentioned this patina sort of being like a, you know, a, a silicon type device. Um, does that cause CPD or could it cause it CPD? It can. Um, we have found, I say we, the industry has found that common path distortion generally occurs in the hardline plant. It can occur in the drop too, of course, but anywhere there's corrosion in the signal path. And by, when I say signal path, the signal path, it's common to the downstream and the upstream. So that corrosion acts kind of like a diode or yeah. a diode mixer. And there's that P type semiconductor behavior we talked about earlier with, with certain types of corrosion. And the corrosion can be anywhere in, in the signal path. And that's that, that diode-like behavior um, acts like a, a mixer yeah. and a mixer circuit, which generates some in different frequencies. And what you wind up with then is common path distortion. So yeah, out, the output of a, of an amplifier in the hardline plant where levels tend to be higher, tends to be where you're more likely to see it or, you know, somewhere fairly close to the amplifier within a few spans of the amplifier. But realistically, CPD can occur anywhere. It can occur in, in end of line chassis terminators, that's been a problem that the industry has found over the years. Um, you know, so pretty much anywhere along the, hard, the hardline feeder plant, it's possible to have that. And the main reason is um, the RF levels tend to be a lot higher there than they are in the subscriber drop. And here I'm talking about downstream levels. There's still some research being done on what's the impact of upstream, uh, of high level upstream signals coming from cable modems in the subscriber drop. And some lab testing has shown that, yes, you can generate CPD in the drop as a result of of corrosion or when corrosion exists in in uh, say drop connectors and stuff and you've got high level rf signals in practice um it's been real hard to determine if it's really there it probably is but th there's still work going on in that area 
And that becomes more relevant as we go to a 204 megahertz return and higher frequency re returns where we are going to be putting more energy in, into the return. It's, that's that's why we're actually looking at at more energy in return and return and what the impact is. Oh yeah, but it, yeah, any place you've got corrosion in the signal path, you can yeah. have common path distortion. And it all gets back to this patina um, that we've, we've talked about, and it depends on the composition of it. And yeah, it can it can act like a diode, yeah. which is not good. Of course, we also now know that it can also act like an attenuator. Also not yes. good. All right. Continuing our list of tips here. Use ground blocks, drop passives like splitters and directional couplers, actives like drop amplifiers. Make sure that they're made out of materials that aren't going to result in a dissimilar metals interface. You may recall from high school chemistry class that dissimilar metals means galvanic corrosion. Ooh, not yes. good. Um, that's a that's a bad thing. So if you're in a position at your company to discuss the center conductor seizure mechanism and even the plating and stuff that's used on the, the threads and, and whatnot, talk about that with the manufacturer of the products that you use. Um, specifically with the center conductor seizure mechanism, you want to make sure that, that that mechanism isn't going to provide a dissimilar metals interface to the copper center conductor or copper clad center conductor of the drop cable. Ideally, you want a large contact surface area and hopefully um, high contact force in, in that interface. And that helps to minimize the, uh, the occurrence of oxidation on the copper. Will it block, prevent it completely? Not necessarily, but it's sure going to do go a long way to keeping it down to a dull roar. That's a good thing to keep in mind. And of course, got to give a plug to SCTE standards. So use connectors and, and drop pieces and parts. Um, that meet the, the various SCTE standards. Now, this last one is not really a recommendation, but it's a question I asked when I wrote the article called uh, on th that this presentation is based on way back when. And I asked this question, and it's something that additional research would need to be done on. And the uh, this could be controversial because it would be pricey, um, and it may and it may not make a difference. But it, I think it's something worth investigating. And th the idea is to consider abandoning feed through drop connector design. Now, if you think about the drop connector, an NF connector on series 59 or series six coax, the center conductor of the cable is also the center conductor of the connector. Um, we use pin type F connectors for series 11 coax. Uh, so we've been doing that for some time. And some of you may remember the old uh, 611 or, or what some people call RG7 cable. I don't, I don't even know if it's being made anymore, but I think if I remember right, the connectors for that cable um, was a pin type connector. So we've got experience with it, but for series 59 and series six uh, drop cables, we use feed through F connectors. Um, there it's are- just a center conductor. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's it. That's the definition of a feed through connector. Um, but pin, so pin type F connectors are available for these smaller cables. They're pricey. Um, I won't argue with that, but the question is, would would the added materials cost offset service calls and truck rolls? I would it fix the, the corrosion on the tip on on that center or conductor, least, or at least reduce it? Especially yeah. if if the if it's a good quality pin connector that has a real good uh, female pin vise um, where it grips the uh, center conductor of the cable um, with a real high contact force. And that that tends to, uh, if it, particularly if it, it can be a gas type type uh, grip, and I don't know how practical that is in a pin type connector, um, but certainly if you know anything that can be done to improve that interface is is certainly something worth thinking about. I don't know the answer to this question. It might be that pin type connectors don't make that big a difference. Maybe they do, but more more research would have to be done here. So just tossing this idea out there is is a little bit of food for thought. Yeah, I mean, they do have pin connectors for like BNC, SMC, you know, the smaller type connectors, but those are often used indoors. So I don't think we have a really good sample size of how this would be used outdoors unless it's for the hardline connectors that have real pins in them. Well, we've got this, we've got the uh, pin type F connectors for series 11 coax. So as an industry, we've got experience with those connectors. Right. I don't know to what extent this corrosion issue that we've talked about today has been a problem um, in series 11 pin type connectors. Maybe it's not a problem at all, um, or maybe it is. I don't. I don't know. I mean, if it is, then that says okay. Then never mind. That's this is not something worth investigating. But may, but maybe it is. It's just it's just a, an idea to consider. Okay, so we wrap this up then. 
and this is the answer here, there's no mysterious capacitance buildup or static charge buildup that causes signal levels to drop, causing those snowy analog TV pictures or tiling in the video chan digital video channels or, or FEC errors, not FECs, but FEC errors in high-speed data service. It's just good old-fashioned corrosion. There's the so, magic. <laughs> and that's it. That's the magic. And there we have dispelled the myth, hopefully. And um, so basically, when the drop's disconnected from the mating interface, whatever it is, um, you hook it up to a field, field meter, disconnect from the field meter, plug it back into the interface. All you've done is, is scrape or scrub some of the patina off the center conductor and maybe a patina of corrosion off the threads of the, of the F connector. Um, Remove some of that corrosion, and you ex expose fresh metal, and signal levels come back to normal. And that's what's going on. So, questions? We do. We have quite a few questions. Um, so, David Corbel starts off, um, doesn't this effect occur also between the shielding and the connector? It always surprised me that the shielding is just pushed into the connector. Well, the answer, and, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, and the answer is yes, because I didn't really get into the corrosion that can happen um, on the shield. Remember, as, as I mentioned before, the shield of drop cable is, is an APA tape, which is aluminum polypropylene aluminum tape um, with a, an aluminum braid over the top of it. That's the typical dual shield configuration. It's aluminum and aluminum will oxidize when it's exposed to air. In fact, right after it's manufactured, it starts to form a thin layer of patina on it. That's, that's just part of the chemistry of corrosion. And, and yes, if the corrosion is, is bad enough in the shield, it too can um, act like an attenuator because that aluminum oxide does not make a very good conductor. Uh, and that just goes back to proper connector prep and making sure that you prep, that you properly prep the cable, put the connector, the, the correct connector on the cable and you know, tighten everything up and make sure you weatherproof everything. Keep the moisture out of there. Keep the air out of there to the, to the best of your ability. Yeah. So... Same problems. Um, uh, Thomas said, uh, Tomas said, this episode is really how it's worked. Great episode. So thanks, Thomas, for that. I have to say, Ron, I, I, this episode, even for me, is, is just a, yet another one where I'm just like, you know, I've always thought of corrosion of just like rust, you know, some, something that happens when moisture gets on uh, our plant components, but you really broke this down to show how much more involved is there with the chemistry and stuff. So, you know, I agree with Tomas. Thank you so much. There's a lot of good information here. Hank Yon says, um, we almost never see CPD in the network when there is power on the cables and splitters. Um, Interesting input. Thank you, sir. And David Corbell comes back and says, if I may, I would like to ask the ultimate repair question. Is a kink cable better straightened out or cut and splice with connectors and a coupler? Many thanks for your excellent presentations. Ron, what are your thoughts on that? Straighten out that kink cable or cut it and splice it which is uh which are well, you introducing more issues in there <laughs> this is this is a major it depends um, <laughs> and and seriously it is it depends on the severity of the kink if it's um if the kink is bad enough and you're not going to be able to straighten it out if it's hard if it's on the hard line cable if you attempt to straighten out that kink there's a good chance you're going to crack the shield if yeah. it's on drop cable if it's kinked really if it's not kinked too badly, you might be able to straighten it out. You kind Probably of roll it and twist be... it. <laughs> well, yeah, but you might not be able to see what's going on underneath the jacket of the cable. And it may be that the what's happened is right where the, when the kink happens, you're you're um, you're actually moving the center conductor closer to the shield on one side of the kink and farther away from the shield on the other side of the kink, and you're you're changing the impedance of the cable at that point and causing a point right. of impedance discontinuity, which results in a, a potential source of a reflection or an echo. Um, and if you try to straighten it out and maybe it's not a bad kink and you straighten it out and, and it's okay, um, you can probably get away with it. If it's a very severe kink, you probably better cut it and, and reconnectorize the cable. Hopefully it's, it's near the end of the cable um, where you can, um, and you've got enough slack in there, you can just cut it off at the kink and then put a new connector on and, and get around the, uh, uh, or get away from the problem of the kink. If the thing is mid span, 
I am not, at least when it comes to drops, I am not a fan of splicing no. a drop. Replace no, the drop. That would always be my just recommendation. Replace but. the drop. It's yeah. You, you, you're going to come back to this drop eventually. It's going to be probably a couple of years from now, and and you're going to be like, who put that connector in the middle of that drop that now has well, corrosion in it? <laughs> yeah, and we and we know what happens, Brady, with water in the drop. See it all the time. <laughs> We're on a couple of cable labs and SCTE committees where we've talked about this. So we did a paper at SCTE about water in the drop. and We see it all it the time to... with P&M. I mean, I can't tell you how many drops we go to and with because Proactive Network Maintenance says this customer's having issues. And there's a there's a splice right in the middle of the drop that has water and corrosion in it. <laughs> so. Yep. Yep. Just just replace the drop. It's much easier because you're going to be you're going to be preventing. Yeah, it's going to take you a little extra time to do that, but you're going to be preventing a truck roll down the road. So I, I think um, I think Hank Jan asks a really good question about um, the ultimate repair. <laughs> um, but yeah. oh, I'm sorry, David asks a really good question about the ultimate repair. But it is ideally the best thing you're going to do is replace that the cable altogether. Um, yeah, so. that's right. Yeah, just uh, avoid the split. Hank Jan, I think you said uh, CA. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. Uh, so what does the 50, 60 volt AC do to the corrosion? Does it prevent it some? Yes. Um, the cable, this is an interesting thing. The, uh, of course, you, I think as most of you know, the hardline cables on our plants are aluminum. And there was some, some um, consideration years ago given to powering active devices with DC, not AC, but DC. And unfortunately, with DC going through that aluminum, oh, at the interfaces, it'd get this galvanic corrosion going on. And that was not good. And it, um, and I'm trying to remember the research. Uh, I think they, the research that was done experimented with alternating current when they found, okay, so you got to rule out DC. That's not good with when you've got aluminum in there. Um, but with, D, with AC, I think they could get down to um, a fairly low frequency. I want to say a few hertz. Mm -hmm would help to prevent the corrosion buildup. And of course, obviously with 50 Hertz in Europe or 60 Hertz in, in the Americas, um, we're not gonna be changing that on our, our hardline plant. So yes, that can help to prevent corrosion. So at SCT Expo this year, there was a vendor, I, I don't wanna mention the name, but they they were experimenting with like a, a low, like a 10 Hertz or um, a, somewhere around there, but it, they were getting away from the 50, 60 uh, Hertz powering and going to a very low uh, alternating powering. I, I, I can't remember if it was 10 hertz or something like that. Anyhow, John Downey was was t telling me about that um, that pow new powering supply option. Um, but the reason they couldn't go to DC was specifically this. If you go to DC, you lose that opportunity to still kind of dislodge some of the corrosion that's in the plant. But it's a new powering solution that may be coming out in the Well, in it's future. interesting that, that they call it a new solution. <laughs> um, because the research I mentioned on on uh, seeing what happens over frequency, you know, DC, and we've known about that for decades. Yeah, is is that the research was done? I think back in the eighties, yeah. so you know, forty years ago. So this is not new stuff. The, the industry's known about this. Unfortunately, uh, you know, as people retire and leave the industry, particularly those you know, those of us who are old timers in the business. And, a lot of that institutional knowledge goes away. And we have to rediscover it again. We got to rediscover this stuff and reinvent it and say, well, no, we knew this and we did this 40 years ago. So no, this isn't anything new. Um, anyway, yeah, what's new is old again or what's old is new. It comes again. around. Yeah. So. It's like clothing. You know, don't throw away your bell bottoms and platform <laughs> shoes. We'll come back into It'll style. will come back in style again. Yeah, plaid's always in style though. Um, okay, I, <laughs> you got it. You're sporting it. <laughs> that shirt will never go out. Um, so Mia, I think, did we get through all the questions then? Yeah. I think we're good then. Ron, this was a great episode. I learned so much once again. Thank you so much for your insights again. Thanks everyone in the chat who joined in. This was a treat for me and I think everyone else on there too. Um, so big thank you to everyone who joined in. Um, if you didn't get your question in, drop them down below and we'll be sure to try to include them in the future show. Speaking of future shows, everyone, um, do hit the notification and subscribe bell if you didn't so you get notified of our future shows coming up. Um, there it is right there. You can see that. Uh, I will be at Cable Labs uh, Winter Conference in Orlando at the end of March. I'll also be attending the Angacom in mid-May. In mid so if 
any of our viewers happen to be attending those shows, please let me know. Love to see you there. We'll be back next week, March 15th, for episode 97 of our Doxa show with John Downey, who's now sporting a full head of hair. So be sure to attend live and comment on his hair uh, if you're able to. We'd love to have your participation in the chat. Until then, thank you so much, Ron, for the excellent show today. Thanks, everyone, for joining in, and we'll see you very soon on our next show. Thanks, everyone. Take care.